we talked on the phone to get ready for it today. I was like, so why am I? No, that, I'm honored and humbled to be here. I was telling Diana beforehand, typically when I give presentations, it's not to a group of friends or, and people that I sit on boards with and work with. And if I don't know you people, then I know your reputation and really admire. So it's an honor to, to chat with you. Um, we're going to talk for about 10 minutes or so a piece. Um, uh, I was already introduced by Patricia. Currently, my job is Executive Director of Faces Without Places. Those of you who don't know what that is, we're the only local nonprofit that exclusively serves the educational needs uh, of children and youth experiencing homelessness. So that number in our service area, which is the whole region, northern Kentucky and greater Cincinnati, that number is 6,000 young people a year. Um, I won't go into all the details of what we do. I do want to talk about afterward, though, about that VIBE program. Uh, we're about to launch our seven-week summer camp uh, for kids experiencing homelessness, and, and we, we're based out of DeSales in East Walnut Hills on the upper level of where Drew and all her people meet with the assembly. Um, so that's, what, that's my paid life. and my unpaid life, I work with Seth and Pat in Sedamsville, uh, to Sedamsville CDC. Um, I do some human services work with the city on the advisory committee with Matt, um, and I'm on the Workforce Investment Board for Southwestern Ohio. Um, my whole life has been spent in nonprofits, um, and, and being involved in nonprofits and or education in some capacity is what led me to meet Patricia, because it became clear to me that I couldn't do sort of the human work um, that I wanted to do without taking community development, brick and mortar, et cetera, into account. So the way we talked about breaking this up is I'll probably stick more to the, I don't know if I want to call it socio-emotional or, or human aspect of community development, and then Peg will take over, you know, some of the brick and mortar, the investment, and all the things that, that she does so well at PNC. Um, so for my end, I was, and I'm not going to be rowdy today. I got rowdy at my board meeting this morning, so I'm it's out of my system. Um, uh, <laughs> I began my career rehabbing buildings in Over the Rhine with Restock and now Over the Rhine Community Housing uh, for affordable housing. And I was on the board of the drop-in center when the conversations about the move started happening. Um, moved on since from the drop as the move did eventually happen. And it was really probably that affordable housing work um, when I started actually adopting buildings and leading a quarter million dollar rehab projects of the buildings and also doing my, my human-centric work with folks at the drop and workforce development, that I realized these two things, there was kind of oftentimes a gap um, that we, we can do really well sometimes with buildings or we can do really well sometimes with investing public dollars in workforce investment, but sometimes there's a gap. To, to work in a neighborhood like Sedamsville, you need both. You need the buildings and you need the work. Um, there's a couple models that I'll point out that are specific examples locally and then some macro examples of where at least I think this works well um, as I go on. So I'm going to stick to corporate social responsibility, right? Those of you all in the nonprofit sector, which is everybody in here in some capacity, it sounds like. Uh, that's our buzzword, right? Corporate social responsibility. And there's a lot of talk in our sector, too, right, about this idea, this corporate partnership. Uh, it's interesting, you know, the breakdown, and this, I don't want to insult anyone's intelligence in here. That's the other thing I'm kind of worried about because we all know so much. Uh, you know, the breakdown for donations to organizations like Faces Without Places, which is trying to break the cycle of poverty so that we have folks to live in all these nice communities that we're all developing. Um, the breakdown of those donations were a 72% individual, um, foundations 15%, and bequests are 8% and corporations are only 5%. So truly, I should be telling you how to get people to put you in their will, um, statistically, <laughs> more so than corporate uh, partnerships. But that's not to, I didn't give that statistic to demean the presentation itself because those corporate partnerships are important because, and you mentioned it in your intro, of the sort of intangible and these relationships that can come from it. A line that I like to use is um, the organization I'm at now, incidentally, is 70% grants. And so I'm on a real mission to have that flipped in at least 50-50 in a year, 70-30 individuals favored um, in two years. Um, I like to say, in my opinion, what I've noticed, you know, a, a grant maker, a foundation will date you. They like to date you. An individual is more likely to marry you. But a corporation will adopt you. And if you can get adopted, um, if Faces Without Places can get adopted, if St. Angeles CDC can get adopted, who's, who's our, our biggest corporate neighbor, you know, um, and reach out to them and, and connect with them and actually adopt us and, and work on, 
you know, more than just a tax write work on. So if we help, if we speak on your behalf um, to develop Peter Kramer and you get an abatement, can we get a piece of that pie? That sort of thing. Um, then you can have a lot of longevity. And then again, more doors, at least in my opinion, have been opened because of that. Six very specific ways that corporations and our sectors play in the same sandbox effectively. All right. So the first one would be corporate cause promotions. Um, and corporate cause promotions, these first three uh, sound really, really similar, so there's but a few unique differences. Um, these are sort of, there's no donation tied to it, there's no behavior change ask uh, tied to it. It's simply a corporation speaking on behalf of an issue. So a macro version, a national version of this to help make it real would be Ben and Jerry's and global warming. Right, so Ben and Jerry's, if you buy a Kona ice cream, five cents is not necessarily going to save the rainforest. But everything Ben and Jerry's does kind of has this undercurrent. They're talking about global warming, that's one of their things. Locally, uh, the best example I could come up with um, would be Procter and Gamble and marriage equality or gay rights or employment, uh, fair employment practices. Procter & Gamble's made no bones about that. They were one of the first in the nation. Uh, their name is all around town for a few weeks a year with the rainbow flags. Um, they don't donate proceeds of uh, toothpaste or cereal or the 700 other thousand other things they make necessarily to the HRC, but they're constantly, that's, the, that's part of their, their stick. And of course it helps them retain top talent. Um, another one locally, and I don't know if this even really counts, but I wanted to bring it up because it means a lot to me is every single thing Santa Ono does on behalf of UC involves childhood literacy. You know, Santa Ono is so out in front with childhood literacy. It's not a corporation, I understand that. UC is not a corporation, I understand that. But I think it's a good example. People have come to know Santa Ono. He's the president of UC, yeah, but he's also the childhood literacy guy. Um, and he's really brought a lot of attention to an organization I used to serve as board chair called Wordplay in the north side. Um, you know, Santa Ono was right there at the beginning to help us get the word out. And while he never cut a check personally, um, he really made it possible for me to get into certain doors and go down certain avenues. The second one is corporate related marketing. This one's a little sexier because it typically involves money, right? Uh, corporate related marketing is the buy this, a portion of the proceeds go to X. Um, I think it's probably an appropriate time to pause this for a second. The reason I'm going in this order is because what I found, and I'll give you real examples that I've been involved in, um, this kind of pathway I think is a good best practice to start with the co corporate cause promotions. Then after you grease the wheels a little bit and get them to, hey, what about, what if we got five cents off every whatever you sell? and moving down. So corporate related marketing, a great local example uh, is the organization uh, I serve, Faces Without Places. Uh, GetaFest, does anyone not know what GetaFest is? Does anyone not know what Geta is? Any new newbies to Cincinnati? I moved to Cincinnati from Atlanta in 1997 and uh, when I discovered what Geta was, I, I was very excited. Skyline, not so much. Um, I was expecting chili, now I love it, but it took me a minute. But GetaFest, donates um, a percentage of every single kid's game they have to Faces Without Places every year. That netted us $10,000 last year. But of course, you gotta pony up, right? So what do we do? We provide the volunteers. Um, so we provide the volunteers to them. We get somewhere $10,000. It seems to go up about two grand a year, so hopefully this year we'll get a little more. Um, Another great one that I was a part of was when I was working with Maria across the street. I was at Community Matters, which is the sister to Education Matters. Uh, <laughs> education Matters works on GED, Adult Education, Community Matters, Community Development, the things that all of you do. Um, at Community Matters, I hit up my friends down in Lexington. Anyone uh, like West Six beer? Anyone hit up West Six beer? So West Six released that Pay It Forward Porter in the purple can. And I got a hold of Ben Self, the founder of the brewery, and I was like, I want in on this the second it happens, because the whole shtick with uh, the Pay It Forward Porter is at 50 cents from every six pack goes to a nonprofit. They have five distribution areas. One is Northern Kentucky and Greater Cincinnati. So Community Matters was the first recipient of the Pay It Forward program um, through West Six Brewing down in Lexington. West Six, incidentally, for the CDC uh, friends in here. West Six bought a building out on West Six, it's not just a clever name, 
in Lexington. They bought a warehouse similar to the Hutch building across the street there on West 8th where Waterfields is. And um, they bought this building with the brewery, and now it has a bike repair shop and a co-op this and an aquaponics this and a pizza this. And they have really helped transform a whole area. Um, pay it forward, netted us. It was like three grand. And then Stegnero Distributing, you floated by them. Why don't you all match this stuff, huh? Local guys made good. You guys should match it. So we got six grand, and all we did was drink porter for a month. <laughs> um, I don't like porter, but my wife, humor, she, she liked it. Um, so that's a great example. Um, and then macro, sorry, I'll hurry up. Uh, Lysol, litter prevention, and cleanup. Uh, five cents is donated per purchase of a uh, Lysol product to keep America beautiful. Corporate social marketing. This is a little more intense. I had a tough time coming up with the local example. Corporate social marketing is a corporation that adopts you and your cause actually pushes uh, uh, the desired behavior change that you're seeking on your behalf. Does that make sense? So the best national example I could come up with was Subway and practicing healthy heart habits in partnership with the American Heart Association. Um, a side personal note, the American Heart Association apparently is really awesome because I live right on 4th Street um, next to the Taft Art Museum and I walk across the Purple Bridge a lot to go see movies. And when I do, I always see these hearts on the bridge telling me to do it. And I'm usually smoking a cigarette and I feel bad. And I do though, but the point is I do actually feel kind of crappy. Um, I keep smoking, it will, doesn't matter. Yeah. But so I'm online trying to find out who, where those hearts came from. And then I have my textbook from Roxanne Spillett and I'm doing it at the same time because I like to multitask or ADD. And I'm doing it and I realize it's both the American Heart Association. So they've obviously done a really nice job of getting their message out there. Locally, it was tough. It was really, really tough, but I'm going to keep it to Price Hill. Um, and if you have a good example, let me know. My friend Ryan Mulligan is a UC professor who teamed up with Cradle Cincinnati, who teamed up with Children's, who teamed up with Cincinnati Health Clinics to reduce the toxic stress level of expectant mothers by re, uh, redesigning health clinics. So behavior change and to help expectant mothers in Lower Price Hill specifically and East Price Hill because the, the clinic they're starting at is the one right across the street there, the West 8th Health Clinic. I don't think it's a great example, but I love Ryan and I wanted to talk about him. Um, <laughs> corporate, phila <laughs> corporate philanthropy. This is the one we're most familiar with, I think. It could be in-kind, it could be money, etc. Um, this one, you got to grease the wheels a little more. Or if you find that magic relationship uh, with a corporation that really loves what you do and that mission works, sometimes you can jump right into this one and bypass all these little marketing steps. Um, the best example of this one, um, two organizations I'm affiliated with, Euler and PowerNet, uh, providing the free Wi-Fi for Euler School. Um, and then they've extended out. Now there's free Wi-Fi in Lower Price Hill. Um, I let them have access to one of our buildings, at the old Urban Appalachian Council on 2115 West 8th, so we can provide Wi-Fi for our neighbors on that side, up State Street, on the other side of uh, West 8th. And then PowerNet also, currently, for our summer camp for, for <coughs> homeless kids that starts next week, donated tablets for all the kids in our camp so that they can learn how to use a tablet um, and how to do homework and math and things um, on their on their tablets. Our camp's real academic focused. Thanks, thanks Mike. Actually, uh, Mike's kind of a tough act to follow. I'm not nearly as entertaining, probably, but uh, but I'm going to start by talking a little bit about just the flow um, on from what Mike was talking about. I'm going to talk a little bit about something you may or may not know about PNC. I am going to talk about our work in neighborhoods and some of the ways in which we approach that strategically, just to give you sort of the insight from a funder's perspective. But I'm going to tell you first about one of our corporate initiatives. So in 2004, about around 2003, the folks who run PNC Foundation, our corporate foundation, were looking around and thinking, you know what, we spend a lot of money, we invest in a lot of things, good things, but where can we point to where we've actually moved the needle on something, right? So in 2004, we announced um, a 10-year, $100 million commitment to early childhood education. Our research showed that at that point in time, there were no corporate foundations, no real big business emphasis on early childhood. But when we did the research, we figured out that if we could impact the lives of zero to five-year-old children around literacy, we could impact generations, right? We could impact <coughs> generational poverty. And, um, and we thought that was a good, valuable thing to do. And so we assembled a big national advisory uh, committee. We partnered with Sesame Street and Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, and they had never done that kind of corporate partnership before. It was a big new thing for them. 
and um, and uh, and we began to and we launched a multi-pronged comprehensive approach around how about around impacting early childhood education. It's now a 350 million dollar um, initiative still going on, and at this point we've touched over 2.3 million children. Um, and it's and and we have among the elements of the program um, are. Um, it's not just dollars, right? So the dollars are part of it. We, we um, initially funded multi, provided multi-year funding in each of our major markets, including Cincinnati, um, a, a program where we did like an RFP and solicited initiatives that involved collaboration amongst various agencies and, um, and had a sustainable or scalable um, potential for outcome. So um, among the things we funded here, we did a, a, a three-year project with um, the Museum Center, the Cincinnati Nature Center, the Northern Kentucky um, Community Action uh, Commission, which administers Head Start there, and I think CAC on Hamilton County side. And we trained early childhood educators in how to teach STEM, how to teach science, technology, math, et cetera, to young children. And um, so that was one of the things that we did here. There were a variety of other things that we've done in other places. Um, this year, we just, uh, about three weeks ago, we just had the ribbon cutting for the new um, Heakin PNC Grow Up Great Family Adventure play, Interactive Playground um, at the Snell Riverfront Park, which we also funded to include some programming around science and biology and river history through the Recreation Commission. So, um, so that's, that's the cash part, right? Well, so in addition to that, we have 54,000 employees. Um, that's a pretty valuable asset. And what we did when we first launched the program was we, uh, we changed our HR policy to allow for our employees to be paid for up to 40 hours a year to volunteer in early childhood centers, right. primarily Head Start. Head Start is one of our, uh, Head Start USA is one of our principal partners. And, um, and we further incentivize our employees to do that by saying if they band together in little groups and they put in up to so many hours a year in a, in a Head Start center, that center is eligible for a $1,000 grant, oh. which doesn't sound like a lot, but in early childhood programs that are like hand to mouth on a regular basis, a thousand bucks is not chump change. Um, so, uh, and then in addition, if you go on our Grow Up Great website, um, you can download tons of really good fact-based, evidence-based learning materials that parents, guardians, teachers can download in Spanish and English um, for free. And um, we provide those learning kits also in our branches. So um, finally, what we've also, um, not finally, but among other elements, um, is advocacy. So, um, so our chairman CEO, including the one who retired a few years ago and our current one, have regularly testified before Congress on the value of early childhood education. We are a leader, uh, Cheryl Rose um, it was in the Leadership Cincinnati class, it was her project that got the preschool promise going. And um, so we've been a big, uh, big supporter of that. So we are, um, we are advocates locally in this market and also nationally for changes in policy and, and for funding around early childhood. We actually, Margaret Hulbert at United Way, who's the public policy director of United Way here, is uh, one of the foremost um, experts in, in early childhood funding um, policy work in Ohio. And she actually met with all of our presidents in all of our, for all of our markets in Ohio so that we could all be working together on the Ohio budget, which recently included a pretty substantial increase in, in uh, early childhood funding. So um, it's, you know, it's, a, it's that comprehensive approach um, that a corporation can take when they can leverage a m multiple assets, um, multiple resources against a particular thing. We also have more LEED certified buildings than any company on the planet. Um, it's the standard for how we do things, all of it, down to the fact that all of our copiers are default set to double-sided printing, and all of our employees receive um, reusable water bottles, and we have filtered water available on every floor. Um, so that we can minimize the use of little plastic bottles and you know things like that. But it's also the big things like our HVA systems, HVAC systems, and all the recycled materials that we use in our carpets and all the all that kind of stuff. So anyway, um, and those are those are among some of the kind of things. Now, um, that's on the social responsibility side of the world. Um, banks, in particular, are bound by a federal regulation called the Community Reinvestment Act. And how many of you know what that is? Or you think you know what it is? Yeah. 
Not funny. everybody. I'm surprised. Yeah. So, um, so back in um, in the late 70s, when I was uh, actually still in college and was working for the National Federation of Housing Counselors, um, there uh, there was a, a federal law passed uh, in 79, I think, called the Community Reinvestment Act. Um, there had been a practice at that time where banks were um, not lending in declining neighborhoods, right? They, like somebody would apply for a mortgage and they would go, you know, it's kind of a risk. We don't think we're going to get paid back because the property values are going down, which guess what? Contributed to the property values going down, right? Mm -hmm. so, um, so in an effort to counter that, um, CRA was passed and it was updated in the 90s and um, uh, to actually um, give it a little more teeth. <laughs> there are three tests banks are evaluated. Um, on actually national banks, um, and there are different now regulatory agencies, and, and now the CFPB's got a role to play in all of that as well. And uh, the Fed is, is sometimes a, a regulator for us. We're a national bank, so we're regulated by the OCC, the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency. And, um, and so every so many years, um, we provide all kinds of information um, to our examiners. Our examiners conduct a big exam, which goes on for a long time these days. And, uh, and they publish a public evaluation. And that public evaluation rates the bank. Ours was just issued and we're an outstanding. We've been an outstanding ever since the beginning of, of ever since the law was passed. What that means is, and it's, it's, uh, it's rated on three tests. 50% of the test is lending. That would include home mortgage, home improvement, refi, and small business lending, as well as community development loans. 25% of the test is services. How are you meeting the, the needs of customers to have access to banking services? So it might be bricks and mortar. Increasingly, it's also technology-based. There's a whole wide range. And it also includes volunteer leadership and service in uh, low and moderate income neighborhoods to benefit low and moderate income people. And 25% um, of the test is investment, which includes not just the big tax credit investment programs like new markets and low income housing tax credits, but also um, uh, certain grant making um, it, to benefit low and moderate income people and communities. In addition, um, we also provide service leadership, right? So I'm on the executive committee for LISC uh, in town. I'm on the board of the Cincinnati Development Fund. I'm on the board of the Catalytic Fund. Um, I'm on the board of the, um, of the Cincinnati Equity Fund, which is the debt arm of 3CDC. Um, and, and then that's just me. I do, I'm also um, I was the founding chair of Strategies to End Homelessness. Um, I'm still on that board, and I'm the chair of the board of the Urban League. Um, so that's just me, right? So we got a lot of employees in Cincinnati, and a lot of us are pretty active in things. We try to be kind of strategic. Like, so if um, we're also an investor in Place Matters, um, for example, we have three, um, three models of place-based investing, as you know, in this community. So one is the corporate-led model, which is 3CDC, right? They're focused, it's the big corporations in town got together, pooled money, um, pooled influence, and focus on over the Rhine, central business district, and the banks, period. That's their focus, right? And um, uh, then there's a second model, which is the Uptown Consortium. University, the hospitals, the big anchor institutions drive that. They pooled their money, influence, resources, and are driving the redevelopment of five neighborhoods surrounding their campuses. Um, and then Place Matters, which is the philanthropic sort of slash community-led model, where we started, a number of funders came together, Greater Cincinnati Foundation, United Way, and others, <coughs> PNC has been, and we've been a part of all of those. So we uh, came together, and we initially had three neighborhoods, and now we've um, helped expand into others. We contract with LISC to administer the program, and, um, and we focus on investing again, comprehensively, in bricks and mortar, driving loans and investments. I mean, even to the point where in Price Hill a few years ago, before the Elber, when the Elberon was still vacant and ugly, um, a few of us managed to get some developers in a van. We took them out on field trips, um, you know, people who could get those developers to come out, and took them out and drove them around and said, okay, here are some sites that you, know, you might consider investing in in these neighborhoods. And I remember Steve Smith, and he will tell you this, say this out loud, he said, no way. And a few years later, um, Model had um, led the re renovation of, of the Elberon. But um, so it, it's a matter of using our influence, using our money, um, and using our um, uh, time and effort um, in a strategic sort of way. So healthcare needs, and even healthcare needs in the communities we target, 
are really important, but we're a bank. So to Mike's point of aligning missions, we focus on things like financial education, neighborhood revitalization, things uh, economic uh, stability and workforce development, things that actually tie into numbers, money, economics, because that's our wheelhouse. And it meets the need. It's where the, it's where the intersection of the need in the community, right, and our wheelhouse. So, um, so that's sort of how we approach things. So what it also means is that when we think strategically um, and we think comprehensively, it means that when we're involved in a Place Matters neighborhood, um, we don't just make our contribution to the Place Matters pool. We also look for ways to lend and invest in those neighborhoods directly. And we leverage our investments in some other organizations. For example, again, citing a Price Hill example, the Sisters of Charity are based there, right? They were founded there. They're very in, uh, embedded in that community. So, um, so in the height of the foreclosure crisis, um, and, and SC Ministries is a part of Place Matters, so in the height of the foreclosure crisis, they, they not only invested through Place Matters, but they also, because they were already investing with legal aid, um, they added some money to the pot for legal aid and asked them to make specific emphasis on Price Hill because it was a Place Matters neighborhood and it's, and it's their home. And it was particularly hard hit, as you might recall, by foreclosure crisis. So, um, so it, again, it's about um, aligning resources directly, like investing through Place Matters into neighborhoods, um, but also indirectly by, um, by using our influence and our power as a funder to help target um, activities in certain areas. Our relationship with the tool bank. So Doug Adams, who's one of our corporate bankers, um, was the, the founding board chair for Tool Bank mm -hmm. and worked really hard to bring Tool Bank to Cincinnati. And so um, we're one of the sponsors of the city's um, 90 day neighborhood, uh, neighborhood program, you know, the 90 day neighborhood enhancement. enhancement. I kept thinking of enforcement. I knew that wasn't right. <laughs> couldn't, I couldn't come up with the right E word. Um, anyway, so, uh, so neighborhood enhancement program, when we stand there at the, at the uh, podium and announce the new neighborhoods for the, you know, the coming year, we also, um, we also uh, announced that we will sponsor uh, free tool use for those neighborhoods for that year. Um, so again, leveraging our investment in Tool Bank anyway, we're pleased to support everything they do, but we ask them to please be, make special focus on the neighborhoods that we're going to also be focusing in. Again, it's about leveraging resources and being strategic. Um, so for you, what does this mean, right? So what this means for you in your neighborhoods is when you're approaching a funder, um, and I, I think what we do is pretty cool. I think I like the way we approach things strategically because otherwise, again, you, we get so many requests for so many good things um, and we can't do them all. So what we try to do is leverage for impact. So to the extent that we can um, leverage our uh, grant making, leverage our lending and investing, you can't tie the two, um, leverage our staff engagement, um, <coughs> through board leadership and participation in things, volunteerism, leverage our, um, our other giving um, toward sort of magnifying the impact of each of those things. That's really the kind of, uh, that's really what we try to do. And um, what that means is to say yes to some things in a more focused way means we have to say no to some other things, right? Which is, nobody likes to do that, but we have to. So, um, so again, we stay out of the healthcare range and stay focused on, on um, the things I described. Um, again, what that means for you is, is that when you're thinking about how to approach a funder, you do have to understand what their um, strategic position is, what they're trying to accomplish, and maybe if they, and find out if they have some particular attachment to a particular neighborhood or area. Um, sometimes it's because they're based in your neighborhood, as Mike was uh, identifying some examples. Sometimes it's because they may be invested in some other way. You know, we give a little priority to neighborhoods where we have a, a physical presence, so, you know, a branch presence, and where we can engage maybe our branch in helping to deliver some financial aid, whether it's Price Hill or Walnut Hills or, or wherever. And we try to encourage Madisonville, we try to encourage our branch teams to be involved in what's going on in the neighborhood. And over the Rhine, with the Over the Rhine Community Council, we, um, we have uh, now three, we started with one, and now we have three people serving on the Over the Rhine Small Business Attraction Retention Team. 
and we help support their Business First grant program because we still think that there's a great opportunity for sort of homegrown small businesses to take advantage of what's happening in Over the Rhine. But we have to be intentional about supporting that effort, just like we have to be intentional about affordable housing in Over the Rhine. And um, uh, because it's not going to happen all by itself. So it's, it's that kind of strategic approach that um, as you're asking um, for money for what you're trying to do, a PNC or from anybody else, A, do your homework, um, learn what their interests are, B, um, don't just think it's cash. Look for other ways to build a relationship with a funder, and it is really about relationships. Um, and, um, and three, it's not just about what you get, it's also about what you give. So what's in it for them, right? That's always a good proposition in any sales transaction, and that's part of what requesting support is. Um, and, um, and, and take the hierarchy into uh, serious consideration. It's also um, about um, leveraging their intellectual capital and, and volunteerism and leadership.